Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another joint episode. This is Jory Rose, and I'm here with my fiance, the amazing Dr. John Schinner. Hey, John. Hey, how you doing, love? I am doing good. I love when we do these conversations and we get so much awesome feedback. I think we're really sparking yeah. some nerves with people and giving them some really great insight into some relationship dynamics. Yeah, I think it's really good stuff. I think that there's people listening. I think that it, it's that insight, that aha that you get when you see it reflected in your own relationship of, oh, shit, that's us. And yeah. and that's the that's the spark of self awareness that I think starts the growth, st- sparks the change. Absolutely. So you and I always have so many different things we can nerd out and talk about, and get excited on um, being able to share. But we have both been seeing um, in our own client experience some patterns, and I have not seen it once. I have not seen it twice. In fact. And just last week, I had almost the exact same conversation three times within two days, which tells me it's even bigger than what I'm seeing, right? If that's just right. three three times in, in two days, how many people are not talking about this dynamic or understanding what's going on? So understand for those of you listening, this is all within confidentiality of our clients. This is really an amalgam of experiences. This is not one particular experience, but really patterns of things that we have both seen. So should we just jump right in and name kind of what we see happening? Do you want to start? Absolutely. I, well, on my side, for the the men, what we're seeing is this, I hate the word, but kind of neediness, this need for reassurance, need for validation, um, frustrated if they're not praised enough. And, and it begins to drive the female in in the relationship, assuming a heterosexual relationship, it kind of drives the female away a little bit. It it has the opposite of what it's intended to do. I think they're, they're looking for reassurance. They're looking for connection and what they get is someone pulling away from them. Could we start right off the bat? As you know, I'm really picky with language and you even said, I hate to use the word needy. Can we even Mm -hmm. just try to right now, figure out another word to even give people language to be able to name their experience so they can really help shift in their own mind, what they're experiencing. Cause for me, I think they're needing reassurance. Well, to me underneath that feels insecure. There's an insecurity beneath the neediness, right? So I'm trying to, if I I peel back the layers. Well, I, I think if we go, if we go to emotion, then there's an emotion there that needs to be addressed. And to the extent we can address that emotion without judgment, it it doesn't become one of the drops accumulated in that bucket of negative emotions. And that's what I think we're really trying to prevent in relationship is this gradual accumulation of small little, the paper cuts that we talk about, those those negative emotions of resentment, disappointment, anger, hurt. Um, And, you know, so I think I, I like thinking about it that way and just and and if we don't look at emotions as right or wrong, if if I just say, hey, baby, like I'm feeling a little bit insecure, I need some reassurance right now. And, and I get that that might be a tall order or a big ask for some men, but I think that's the best way I found to go about it. What, do, what are your thoughts? What's your language? Well, one of the things that I always say, whether it's in romantic relationship, I talk about it a lot in parenting, there is always an emotion driving a behavior. And we tend to overfocus on the behavior and we tend to not slow down to get curious or compassionate or empathic to understanding what is the emotion underneath the behavior. But what we see is the behavior, right? So what the behavior that you named at the beginning was this kind of quote neediness of, you know, do you love me? Are you there for me? Am I enough for you? I mean, how else does this insecurity or neediness come out of reassurance? It's asking a lot of questions. It's kind of overstepping towards in a way that, like you named the dynamic, is pushing the female a little bit pursuit. further. It's pursuit, it's but not in a sexy pursuit. way. <laughs> but not in a sexy oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's not romantic. 
But, it, so, but the question in there could be, am I sexy to you? I mean, that's one of the layers right. of it, I think. Am I desirable to you? Right. So right off the bat, if we could get curious on the emotion under the behavior, that would be a game changer in and of itself. But the behavior comes across as neediness. Well, what, what emotions would you put in there? Because I would say insecurity is an emotion there. Yeah, definitely. Like I'm feeling insecure. I'm feeling maybe threatened in the relationship. I'm feeling uncertain. I'm I'm feeling a little bit off balance. Um, I, I I'm not see feeling a lot secure. Of, I, I'm, I I see a lot of um, patterns in which men aren't feeling important enough as compared to maybe the children or the things that the the wife, assuming you know, married with children dynamics, which is what I've been working with. The men don't feel important enough, like the women are giving more time and attention to the kids, to their own growth, to their own self-care. And so they're feeling a little bit left behind, a little bit left out. Um, I think they're feeling lonely. Uh, You know, some of the dynamics in what I'm observing is the men have their jobs, which may or may not really be fulfilling, likely at this point, not super fulfilling. And they don't have a lot going on in their lives outside of their career and their family. And so they're putting the needs of their own happiness, fulfillment, contentment, joy, all on the wife. But she's got a lot of avenues in which she's spreading her attention. So he sees her not giving him attention. And where she's spreading her attention is really healthy ways, the family, the home, herself, her career, or, you know, whatever that growth for her looks like. So there's an imbalance of attention. So I think he's feeling a little bit left behind. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. It makes me think of, you know, our relationship, how when we first got together, we were quite clear on the fact that since this is a relationship after or post-divorce, that we come number two after the kids, after our own children. And, and I've heard this dynamic in with married men in their first marriage, where I think they get hurt and disappointed and lonely and some of the other things that you mentioned. After him and his wife have children, And the wife's energy tends to turn more towards the children. And these are generalizations, but I can see where he feels like second or third fiddle, which increases his feelings of insecurity or I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. And then I could see him turning more towards work, which is going to increase the disconnection. Right. And yet she's not doing anything wrong by giving attention to the kids because as we've heard so often, at the end of the day for a mom, she's exhausted. She's had kids, you know, hanging on her physical body. And so the last thing she often feels is desirous towards wanting to now enter into sex or more time and attention. All she wants to do is relax and do nothing. And he's waiting Uh for that moment to then say, okay, now you're available to me. Yay. Now it's my turn. And she's like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. And you know, it's funny. You said, you know, she's not doing anything wrong. And I guess at this point in my life and in my career, I don't look at anything in these scenarios as good or bad. They just are. And I think we're just trying to get our needs met amidst, and you know, that's the busiest time of life. And that's where we're seeing a lot of our clients, right? Is where they've got a number of kids that are below the age of say 14. And you know, that, that time of life is busier than anything I ever remember. And you're exhausted. I mean, everybody's exhausted, mom, dad, you name it. Um, and, and so I think just having the perspective of this is the most challenging time in life. This is the most exhausting time in life that you'll see. And, and having some compassion for yourself as well as for your spouse is one help. Well, what is the, 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 what's it called? Like the graph that you draw that you've done when we've done our couples workshops where it talks about how this time is also the most, oh. <laughs> it's like, it's like the biggest <clears throat> dip in what is it? Sat- life satisfaction. So it's, you, it's yeah, kind so, of an inverse of what you might think. Yeah. That's from positive psych where they, they draw, it's a big U shaped curve and it graphs your age on one axis and your satisfaction with life on the other axis. So the 
I think your age is on the X axis. Your satisfaction with life is on the Y axis. So it starts up pretty high when you're in your 20s. And then when you get in your 30s, there's this dramatic drop. As you go 30s, 40s, 50s, it's the bottom of the U-shaped curve. And then when you hit your 50s, it goes back up again to higher life satisfaction, which says to us that when we are parents and we are in the thick of it, that our life satisfaction is pretty low, honestly. And, and, and I think one thing that study misses, and, and I think it's true, however, I think it also misses the fact that being a parent is highly meaningful. Mm-hmm. It's also highly stressful. And we only stress about things that we care about. And, and so I think that it's very meaningful. It's also stressful. It's just, you're not at your happiest in those couple of decades. Well, and it's a competition of values, right? You value Uh everything that you're cultivating and creating because it's also probably the time, not just the most stressful of raising kids, but also when you're trying to work the hardest for the most amount of accumulation of wealth and assets so you can enjoy the later years. So a lot of competition and values. All this to say, this time period is fucking hard, period. Yeah. And how couples are able to name and communicate where they're at will impact their ability to get through it connected or disconnected. So to kind of come back to the beginning, what we're seeing is challenges that are normal, but that are causing greater disconnection. And it kind of is an inverse of what you might think for some, again, heterosexual, typical gender roles as far as emotional expression, right? You tend to have a generalization that men are going to be a little bit more withdrawn emotionally, perhaps a little bit more stoic, ah, jinx, a little bit more stoic, a little bit more physically, um, you know, I guess they're on both ends of what I was going to say. They they kind of would want more sexually, but you tend to think of women as being over nurturing and emotionally aware and emotionally expressive. Like those are some really, really stereotypical gender stereotypes. But some of these dynamics, what we're seeing is these men who are being a little bit more emotive than perhaps the women are actually finding sexy. So here's the interesting dynamic. You want your men to be more, they're being more, and now you're not liking it. <laughs> That's well, a and challenge. It's, it's funny because there's, there's research that shows that male babies are actually more emotive at birth and in the first six months than female babies. Hmm. And so we have the emotion. We've just learned to bury it through that yeah. man box socialization process, right? That, you know, I, I think we get heckled or humiliated or mocked for showing too much sadness or fear or too much joy, love, romanticism, excitement. And so we learn to shut it down progressively. And what are we left with that we can publicly display without embarrassment? I would say it's stress, lust, and the big one, anger, some degree of anger, irritability, frustration, annoyance. And it's, you know, I'm preparing for that keynote talk in Vegas here in April. And so I've been thinking a lot about this and it makes me think of, so that very period that we're talking about that, you know, a couple gets married, they have kids, they're both exhausted. They're both working their ass off. There's no lazy there, by the way, as far as I've seen. I mean, I I just see the husband and the wife just maxing it out, whether it's work or kids or sports or whatever they're doing. And I can see that leading to men getting depressed Hmm. from the dynamics we just talked about. And, you know, Jed Diamond has done some really good work on male depression. And let me just read some of these differences between female depression and male depression. All right. I I think it's really important. And just as a preface of this, you've really given me great insight into the varying ways depression shows up because I think for me, I've always assumed depression just looks like sad and withdrawn and hopeless, right? That uh, there's kind of no motivation in life. And hearing what you're about to read is really, really insightful that again, if we're getting curious about the emotion under the behavior, there may be more going on than we're giving credit to the overall experience of the dynamic of the couple. So, go yeah, ahead. And, and just in general for the listeners, I think of male depression as irritability. When I talk to a, a male client and I understand that there's a lot of irritability going on, the first thing I think at this point is, huh, I wonder if he's depressed. 
because male depression comes out as some degree of anger generally. So here's, let me just contrast, compare and contrast some male and female symptoms of depression. So female, when she's depressed, she blames herself for problems. Male, he blames other people for problems. So he's externalizing, she's internalizing. Female, she feels sad and tearful. So that's typical depression. Men feel irritable and unforgiving. So they'll hold grudges. Female will sleep more than usual. Male will have trouble sleeping or staying asleep. Female, vulnerable and easily hurt. Male, suspicious and guarded. Female withdraws when feeling hurt. Male attacks when feeling hurt. There's that pursuit dynamic. Uh Uh-huh. The woman often suffers in silence. The man will overreact and then feel sorry later. Overreact in anger, I'm guessing. Um, Female will maintain control of her anger, keep it inside. The male loses control of his anger. Um, While the female may have anxiety attacks, he may have sudden attacks of rage. While she lets others violate her boundaries, he maintains very rigid boundaries, pushing other people away. And here's one of the cappers. She feels uncomfortable getting praise. He is frustrated if not praised enough. But listen to all the emotion words on the male side. Blames, irritable, unforgiving, suspicious, guarded, hostile, attacks, overreacts, restless, agitated, anger, rage, oh, feelings blunted, often numb. I mean, frustrated. They're all in the anger family. Yeah. And she's holding it all in. Yeah. So she's internalizing it and he's externalizing it. If and you then, just be, if you just love me more, I'd be fine. Well, then the dynamic is because she's internalizing it, his interpretation is she doesn't care. Which also again? then, because she's holding it in, he may interpret that as she doesn't care, right? Because right. then there's this question of, for some people, anger equals love. That they're acting out because they care. So we have that question often around perhaps what did you witness in your family of origin in which anger was an expression of caring for someone or that you cared it so much that it looks like love. It can be confusing. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and the other piece of it is that if she's withholding, if she's struggling, if she's withholding negative emotions, she doesn't want to share those with her husband because she doesn't feel her husband can deal with that. The last thing she wants to do is share praise, share compliments, be grateful. Like she, I don't think she can get to the positive piece until she's unearthed the negative piece. Right. And he's looking for the positive and she's like, I'm stuck on the negative over here. Right. And I can't even share that because if I share that, you're going to dissolve. Right. And so he's trying and, to and get I also her... Want to say, let me back up just a second. Because yeah. uh, I, I think that you know you mentioned that it's not stereotypical for men to be, to have the insecurity, to need the emotional reassurance. I would say that we need it, but the only place that's safe generally for us to even dip a toe in that water is with our primary relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, it it speaks to the part of you said before that, you know, whatever number percentage, fairly high of men are actually very sensitive. They wouldn't say that they are, but they're actually quite sensitive. Oh, I'd say 95%. Yeah. If we feel things deeply, it's always astounded me. Yeah. Because they're conditioned not to feel that, you know, whenever someone says I'm not emotional, it's always a really interesting question. I'm, I'm sure you hear that a lot with your clients. I hear that with a handful of clients. I'm just not that emotional. And my response is, well, if you've got blood flowing through those veins of yours, I promise you, you have emotion. Not being emotional just likely means you haven't been role modeled what to do with those emotions. So not, excuse me, not being emotional doesn't mean you don't feel. It just means you don't know what to do with how you feel. You don't yeah, know how to label or name. I can interpret that name. a few ways. You don't know how to stay- label... Hold on. You don't know how to label or name what you're feeling, and you may or may not feel safe to express what you're feeling. But to all those things doesn't mean you don't feel. So if he's wanting more time and attention or more reassurance um, to manage whatever level of whether it's insecurity or anger, depression underneath the surface, and if he is coming towards her with judgment, with shame, with blame, Ironically, he's pushing her away, which is going to be the very opposite of what he's seeking, which is for her to step close. So the last thing I'm going to want to do is step towards a partner partner who's shaming and blaming me into stepping towards them. 
right. and the disconnect grows and that's how we end up with divorce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I just see it going that way, right? Like the, the bucket of negative emotions gets more and more filled. The disconnection grows greater and greater. Uh, you know, one person so angry and hurt that they can't overcome it. Um, and, and so I, I think one of the ways I've realized out of this by virtue of our relationship is, and, and I tell this to clients all day long is we need to begin to address those little drops of negative emotions when they occur or shortly after mm-hmm. so that we can, so we don't have to hold on to them. Yeah. And, you know, if I can just say to you, Hey, sweetheart, you know, kind of hurt my feelings when you called me a dickhead the other day. Uh, she doesn't really <laughs> I've never that. done I just, that. You know, I, I, that was just, <laughs> that was just, that was just a bad example, but just, just, you know, as an example, um, if that didn't hurt your feelings, then, <laughs> then you're not emotional enough. <laughs> but if, you know, I think to the extent we can address those in the moment or shortly after, they're not getting into that bucket. We're not holding on to them as a grudge. And then we travel much more lightly. And, and I think the other piece of it, as we just showed, is don't take things too seriously. Don't think, <laughs> take things personally and laugh about a lot of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, God, the, there's so many different ways we can continue to take this conversation. One of which is... Ugh, I, I, I don't even know where to go next. We, we talked about this morning before we hit record, we were chat- chatting about the different areas that we wanted to come up with, you know, in kind of outlining this conversation. How much do you think, just in your experience, and I'll, and I'll kind of share my perspective, of these dynamics occur from any, and I hate the, to use the word trauma, but it's an easy word to go to, trauma from early childhood primary caregiver relationships in which the primary caregiver was... Um, maybe not available. And so some of these patterns of lack of safety and security and relationship got embedded in how our brain is wired, right? Attachment styles and attachment theory. And we know that our brain gets wired for how we believe love to look, which is how it affects our attachment and adult relationships. So it's an interesting question of, you know, what kind of stories are people bringing into their relationship from the beginning around what is their kind of core belief around what is it expected of their partners? Yeah, and I think that's one of the levels of interpretation that I'll go to that, um, you know, in this case, in your example, is it an anxious attachment style that's driving this behavior? You know, was mm-hmm. mom not there for me when I was two and three and four and five? And is that what's driving my need for frequent reassurance? Or the opposite of that is mom gave me over reassurance and now I expect everyone to give me over reassurance because I was built up to be raised on this pedestal and now it feels unloving if someone doesn't put me up on that pedestal. So that's another flip side of that too. Yeah. And I think this also goes back to the question that we ask ourselves at times, you know, is this about us right now? Does Mm -hmm. this have to do with us? Is this about me? Or is this from a past relationship or is this from our childhood? Yeah. Because I think all of those are strong possibilities in this. I mean, I was looking at, um, you know, kind of increasing emotional awareness this morning. And one of the things that you want to be aware of. So for instance, the example is, you know, a car cuts you off on the freeway. You feel anger. You flip off the guy in the car. But one of the precursors to that is, are you aware of your emotional state prior to getting into the car? So in this example, would be, are you aware of your emotional state prior to walking into your house when you have that first interaction with your spouse? What emotions Mm -hmm. are you carrying with you from work, for example? Are you stressed? Are you tired? Are you lonely? Are you hungry? Are you annoyed? Have you just gone through social media? Have you just gone through yeah. social media and you're seeing, you know, distraught and chaos in the world? And then that's why I think one of the great exercises that we can do is to stop and ask ourselves several times throughout the day, what am I feeling right now? Because I think in general, we have so little self-awareness of our emotional state 
that we just shit it out on everyone else without any awareness. And I like the shit rolls downhill theory, as I call it, which is, you know, the boss gets mad at the dad, dad gets mad at the wife, wife gets mad at the oldest child, oldest child gets mad at the youngest child, youngest child kicks the dog. Mm -hmm. No one's getting angry at the proper person. Yeah. Well, uh, and that's why I love mindfulness so much because those those moments, those mindful moments are just check-ins. And the key to do that emotional check-in is to not judge it as good or bad, to not try to fix or solve it, but to just begin to notice. Can I allow and accept and notice whatever it is that I'm feeling in this moment without shame or blame or judgment, but with compassion that whatever I'm feeling is human. And then if we can start to begin to increase that self-awareness of where we're at, we then can be able to have greater self-awareness to either name where we're at to our partners and or how to shift into a different response pattern when that emotion comes up. Because one of the things that I think you and I have really practiced, or I'll say you have practiced, uh, and I tell this to clients, is if you know that you're in an off mood, whether you're stressed or you're tired or you've you know had a hard day or whatever it is, you're really good about giving me that heads up. Say, hey, love, just so you know, here's where I'm at today. For some people, you might even give it on a scale of like a one to 10 if you don't have the emotion to name where you're at. But to tell your partner just where you are at on that emotional scale would give your partner insight into either how to be more compassionate, how to be a little bit more gentle, how to maybe step towards before it gets reactive. Because one of the things I think couples forget is you guys are on the same team. You want to be yep. able to help them and help them be there for your partner. And it's really hard to do that if you're getting that shit thrown towards you. But if your partner walked in the door and didn't say any externalization of blame and just say, wow, honey, oh my God, I, I am so stressed. I've had such a hard day. My guess is the partner would say, oh, baby, I'm so sorry. What can I do? How can I support you? What do you need? Yeah. And that, that strategy of, hey, honey, I'm in a really, I mean, pick, pick the adjective, right? I'm in a really shitty mood. I'm in a really grouchy mood. I'm kind of depressed today. I'm kind of bummed out today. Whatever it is, whatever vocabulary you're comfortable putting on that, you can use that with your partner. You can use it with your kids. You can use it with your coworkers. And every person you do that with, I would argue, is a huge gift. Because now they, well, I'd say the extension of it is, hey, I'm in a really crummy mood today. And it has nothing to do with you. Yes. Now they don't have to take what you're feeling personally. They don't have to waste any energy or time wondering, shit, what did I do to piss John off? And not also, we take so much of others' emotions personally. And the extension of that is, and it's not my job to fix it, yeah. but I can support it because I think that's where, that, that's where the dynamic I think is falling short is in that dynamic of, of the man stepping towards an anger, she then feels like she has to fix it for him. And there's a big difference between, I can't fix what I didn't break. If you did break it, take accountability and a responsibility for sure. what you did to cause that. And it likely isn't about you. It might be exasperated because maybe, you know, he's not getting the attention he needs for what he's feeling, but he's likely not expressing what he's, fle- what he's feeling in a way that makes her want to step towards. Well, and the other thing I like about this is, you know, I like the distinction between an emotion and a mood where mm-hmm. an emotion is short lived in duration. Think three minutes, give or take. It has a cause. So you're driving on the freeway. Someone cuts you off. You feel anger. And a mood, on the other hand, is longer in duration. I think of it as slightly lower in intensity. But here's the kicker. And this is the really important piece moods don't need a cause. And so if you can consider that and just think, huh, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. I'm just in a crummy mood. And give yourself that freedom to feel that mood and be aware that there may be no cause for this mood. That's really freeing too. And I I think it ties back to the mindfulness adage of allow whatever's arising to arise without judgment. Yeah. And the without judgment part takes years of practice for, you know, if I'm looking at your emotions or my emotions, to not judge what the emotion is takes some real practice. So then the next question people might be wondering, okay, great. So I've now noticed I'm in a shitty mood. What do I do about it? Well, you breathe, 
you don't get your mind spinning on what caused it, where do I go wrong? Because if we, you know, kind of ruminate backwards or we have anxiety thoughts of what if going forward, it's going to exasperate it. The irony is the less that we do to try to fix or solve it, the more it's going to go away on its own. So breathing into it, self-compassionate thoughts. One of my favorite ways is to say, this is really hard right now. This And, and the right now is the key word because it's not permanent. It's not permanent. Right. It, it's not pervasive. It's not personal. Um, but to really breathe into, yeah, I'm having a hard day. And can I let that be okay? Yeah, and then and I ironically, guess, I, so, the more you can do that, the faster it passes. Yes. See, my, my approach is similar. And what I'll tell clients is, so practice awareness, be aware of what you are feeling in the moment, label it, put the right emotion word on it, because we know from brain scan studies that decreases the intensity of it, and then turn towards it, like welcome it, know that it's there for a purpose. And, you know, I think the biggest one that I have talked to clients about with this is sort of a depressed mood or a sad mood. And, you know, what I tell them is, look, it gives you the space to think and reflect and create to think about how you want to be treated, how you don't want to be treated, to create new art, to write, to journal. Um, because I think without sadness, we just kind of continue on day to day mindlessly, many of us. Yeah. So, you know, I think turn towards it, don't fight it. I think a lot of men, you know, are struggling. I shouldn't feel this way. It's, that's a, you know, I can't be a pussy. I shouldn't feel sad. And I think that just makes it more intense and longer in duration. Whereas if you turn yeah. towards it and say, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm feeling depressed today. Let me exercise some really good self-care, take a nap if I need to, go for a walk, do an easy workout, go home a little bit early, maybe cancel that meeting if it's unnecessary, um, maybe hang out and play with the kids or you know, just watch a movie. But you know, I think that to realize that we all have emotions and we all have moods and they affect us way more than we realize, and it's just human. Yeah. And the extension of that in our partnerships is to take your own accountability and responsibility for your emotions and your behaviors and try something new. If what's been going isn't working, then stop doing the same pattern that is only causing further disconnection, creating more paper cuts in the relationship. So if we come back to the, the dynamic of what we were talking about of kind of this men needing more from their wives and the wives feeling overwhelmed and kind of withdrawing as a result of that emotional pursuit. In that dynamic, for the men, what would you suggest ways to communicate in a way that a man who has not communicated in these ways might be able to start off practicing same to his partner that might feel a little bit more um, softer or like easier for them to access? I, I would back up a step and have a conversation with my spouse or girlfriend when things are calm and good, saying mm -hmm. something like, hey, honey, you know, there's times when I feel insecure or I need a little extra reassurance. And usually this is related to my mood, like, you know, on a, I'm having a rough day or something. What's the best way that I can say that to you that you can hear it and give me mm -hmm. what I need? Yeah, and, and so I think I would agree on common language, which is funny because I, we've talked about this in the past. I think that because you've done this for me and it helps a lot, but there's a voice in our head that says something like, well, if she tells me exactly what to say, then it's not authentic. Well, OK, I hear that stuff, all the time. Yeah, that really uh -huh. pisses couples off. You know, just tell me what you want to hear. So then I hear it and then you get in trouble for saying what you were told what to say. And well, and I think part of it's, I mean, it's, you know, communication, tone of voice, body language, volume, and the words that you use. So those have to be in sync. Um, but I think that that's, if you can trust, and again, this is kind of like, it's, you have to trust that they are being true, honest, and authentic when they tell right. you, right. and then try it. And, and it might take a little bit of practice. It might take a little bit of fine tuning, but I mean, now I'm comfortable saying to you, Hey honey, like I'm just having a rough day. I, I'm feeling a little bit insecure with us. Can you give me some reassurance? Yeah. And I don't think I do that often, but when I need to do it, man, it sure is nice. And the best way to receive that on the other side, whoever it's coming from, is to be aware of any defensiveness. What are you talking about? I just gave you reassurance an hour ago. Uh, 
because that that defensiveness is just going to be a bigger paper cut than the initial you know thing that gets mentioned so i hear this all the time from couples we talked about this already why do we have to go through this again well guys let me tell you and ladies that wasn't just guys as, as for those men that was hey you know everyone if one partner continues to bring up an emotion or an instance that you've already covered, do your very best to not judge them for bringing it up yet again. Because as hard as it is for you to hear it with the eye roll and the heavy sigh of, haven't we already dealt with this? The response is yes. And if your partner's bringing it up, it's because it doesn't feel resolved inside of them. So have compassion that while you may have gone through this a hundred times, it's not try harder, it's try different. Because if your partner is still feeling unresolved, then maybe respond with, yeah, okay, I know we've talked about this. And how might I respond in a different way so you feel more heard or you feel more understood or you feel more connected? Because that defensiveness is going to cut a knife through connection. Well, and I think along those lines, one of the great metaphors there is because I think people get frustrated when they're like, oh, shit, haven't we covered this ground already? Like to think that you're just going in a circle and tracing the same pattern over and over and over, it feels like you're not making any progress. And I think a far better metaphor is the upward spiral where you occasionally come back to the same issue but you're still moving upward and you're still growing and you're still helping your partner to get past it. It just takes three, four, five, six, seven times to get there. Yeah. I think of it also, you know, this is hard work. This is really hard work. And and I like to Mm -hmm. give the example of, you know, think about a baby learning to walk. The baby keeps falling. And the baby doesn't think to itself, at least I'm guessing not, you know what, this walking business just isn't for me. Even though I see everyone else doing it, I'm just going to sit here and, and stop trying. Like if your relationship is important enough to you to be connected, then keep trying and don't judge the process. But rather, I, I would like to invite you guys to hear this as an invitation towards seeking greater connection. Because we know it takes work. John and I always say love is not enough. It takes a lot of work. Work doesn't mean it's bad. Work means that you are putting value on the outcome, which is a connected relationship, which I think everyone wants. No one gets into a relationship and says, I want to be in a disconnected relationship. At least I don't think all people do. Oh, maybe some people think that. Maybe they just want to have, you know, activity partners and not really be connected. But most people tend to go into a relationship seeking a deeper connection, right? Yes. Most people. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not sure where to go with that now. <laughs> um, huh. But yes, I, I definitely agree. And now I'm totally drawing a blank. <laughs> so so here, here's, here's where I think that, that the key is. Part of it is we know research says that the positive to negative ratio has to be five to one. When it's inverted and there's more negative and that depression habits that you named seep in, look for the moments in which you can step towards your partner in gratitude and appreciation so that way when you are feeling disconnected, your partner's more likely to step towards because there's enough positives left in the bucket. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I, yeah, absolutely. And and so I, I think one of the other things to say, I, I guess this is more for men than women, although I, it's a toss up, is this is not about thinking. Mm. This is not about logic. This is about emotion and how we are feeling. And if to the extent you get better at addressing the underlying emotions, you will have a better relationship. And I mean, I can tell you, I was an emotional idiot when I was like 25. I mean, I was in a PhD program in psychology at Cal and I realized, holy crap, like I don't even know what I feel. And and so I, I think, you know, to just decide that you're going to be curious about emotion to decide that it is really, really critically important to get more emotionally aware and to have a better emotional vocabulary and to be more comfortable speaking about it with your partner, yourself and others. That is, I mean, there was a a researcher at Stanford who his whole theory is that one of the foundational pillars of a happy life is emotional awareness. 
Mm-hmm. And and you know how do you how do you have a happy life if you can't even recognize when you're feeling a positive emotion? Because mm-hmm. happiness is by definition emotional, right? And so you know you never stop learning. It's a lifelong process. You get better at it, and I, I think it's one of the best uses of your time and effort. But I'm biased. Well, we both are. I, I want to finish up with, you know, you read that really powerful list of, of male and female symptoms or, you know, patterns mm-hmm. of depression. If someone heard that and was like, oh my God, that's me. Am I depressed? I never thought of myself as depressed. Now I'm judging myself that maybe I'm depressed and I don't think I am. What might you suggest to men specifically? Ways that they can um, gain some tools and or additional support around acknowledging perhaps maybe they're depressed or what also might be some other factors besides those behaviors might you want to consider to be curious if you're depressed as a male? So great question. And I would say, um, try not to judge yourself, try not to slam yourself that right now, uh, I guess, post pandemic or in the middle of the pandemic, wherever we are, um, anxiety and depression are rampant. There's the pandemic going on across the U.S. and across the world where it used to be about 10 to 12 percent of the population were currently experiencing anxiety or depression. Now it's about 40. So it's gone up almost 40, like 400 percent, four times. And so it's not uncommon. It is it's terribly common to be struggling with depression and or anxiety right now. So I think that's the first step. The second step is, you know, the best ways to deal with it proven are medication, meditation, and exercise. Um, And then I would also add, you know, find a good mental health provider that can help teach you some tools and reflect back to you. Because when you are depressed, you're caught in a number of cognitive distortions or errors in thinking, like all or nothing, black or white thinking for example. And it really helps to have someone reflect back to you and just say, you know, wow, you think everybody hates you? Is that really true? Um, Just again, as a bad example, I'm not really good at examples, but that is the all or nothing thinking. And part of this is learning new ways of thinking. Um, Yeah. And and, and I would say, yeah, the the tools are really important. The, The other part of it though that keeps coming back to my mind there was a study done i don't know 20 years ago marcielo sada barbara Fredrickson, and they looked at that golden ratio you were talking about in individuals couples and executive teams and they found that it was a three to one ratio for individuals four to one for couples five to one for top functioning executive teams and what they found in the executive teams they compared the top 10 percent versus bottom 10 percent based on 360 degrees, employee satisfaction, and profitability. And what they found is that when you had five times as many you statements, open-ended questions, and compliments in their executive meetings, there was flourishing going on. There was creativity, there was innovation, there was new idea generation, and the company flourished. At the bottom 10%, there was five times as many I statements, put-downs, sarcasm, And I think there were statements versus questions. And what they find is that the psychological dynamics slow down and grind to a halt Mm -hmm. so that people are afraid to speak up. They don't voice ideas. New idea generation goes out the window and they don't even want to be around each other physically. And I, I think that same dynamic is paralleled in relationships. Because yeah. you see it, I mean, we've seen it, right? Where that couple just grinds to a halt psychologically. And, you know, like one partner's asking the other partner for reassurance. And in response, they're like, fuck you. I'm still angry about, you know, six years ago. Right. And you're, so you're not going to get your reassurance. You're not going to get your needs fulfilled. Yeah. I think another thing that's really important there is finding ways to fulfill your own happiness and joy outside of your primary relationship. You know, for so many people, they don't know what brings them joy. They have no spark um, internally and that they put too much pressure on the romantic partner to, to provide that for them. And that's a lot of pressure for someone. 
And so finding some hobbies, I know it's not as typical, um, again, generally speaking for men to foster friendships as it is for maybe women. Um, but, you know, finding cohorts to connect with that you can feel your own individual sense of, of joy, of resilience, of hobbies, of things that help you feel relaxed or, you know, creative outside of work and home. There, there's got to be some outside other things that we can be, again, to, to practice that is an internal journey. And that makes me think of the saying, which I think has a lot of truth to it, that happiness is an inside job. And, yeah. you know, I think a lot of unhappy people in relationship are looking to their partner, especially people that externalize their anger and maybe are depressed. They're like, you know, if my wife, for example, would just fulfill my needs or pay more attention to me or nag me less, then I'd be happy as opposed to thinking, okay, it's my happiness, my life, my psyche. What do I need to do? to make myself happy. And it makes me think we should do a, a podcast about happiness and, and positive psychology and absolutely ways to get I'd there. Love that. Well, I think this has been really helpful. Hopefully people listening can gain some insight into perhaps uh, any dynamics in which their relationship is feeling stuck. This was a really specific dynamic that we named of kind of the, the men needing more from their wives and the women withdrawing as a result rather than stepping towards. Um, but there's so many patterns that we named that can be universal, even if that's not the exact dance that's happening in your relationship, understanding the, the male versus female depression, um, coming the source of your own happiness, being able to be more emotionally agile and name and get curious about your experience. I think this is really, really important stuff. Absolutely. And just in closing, I just want to say I love you, baby. I love you too. Thanks, you guys, for listening. Uh, tune in for the next joint episode. Maybe we'll do the happiness one next. Um, if you guys, if this spoke to you, we'd love to get a rating or review. And also, John and I do work with couples together uh, as well as we do our in individual work. So there'll be a link in our both of our show notes for our ultimate relationship website. Uh, if you guys want some more tools working with us, we'd love to be able to be the ones guiding you. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 